So I, I love this little box here because it, it makes me feel like I'm one half of Statler and Waldorf as I'm speaking to you. So <laughs> that stinks. Anyway, um, so yes, I'm John Mark Welker. I'm the Gluster community leader. Uh, I try to expand the Gluster community for users and developers all around the world. And I go to events like this and talk to people like you. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is, you know, first of all, sort of the, the beginnings of Gluster, uh, where we saw it fitting in the early days and how it fits in with sort of like all the um, uh, trends right now that you see going towards cloud and automation, all that stuff. Um, and so you can see right off the bat, when you say, what is this cloud? Uh, I'm actually not going to explain the cloud to you because you already know what it is. But I, I do like to tell the story about how one time I went to an AWS uh, meetup at a cloud expo, and some uh, older gentleman crashed our table and just looked us in the eye and said, what is this cloud? And I was like, <laughs> why are you here? But uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, so uh, it's always an amusing anecdote to start off with. But you know, getting to why do we have a cloud? Why, why are we here talking about OpenStack and the, and the related technologies that go along with OpenStack? It's because for the last dozen or so years, there have been the, these guiding overall trends that sort of fit within the same framework. The trends towards open source, towards, uh, towards commoditization, towards um, virtualization towards uh, anything that gives you more agility in the data center, those are all part of the same basic trend. And open source is an intrinsic part of that. Uh, and from the storage perspective, it took a little bit longer for us to for us to really go full speed on that same path. And that's because you know people get conservative about data. Uh, compute is one thing. You know, I can spin up a VM and trash it, and it doesn't matter because I can just spin it back up again, and it's cool. Uh, data, you trash your data, and you're you know you're going to be fired. <laughs> so people were kind of loath to virtualize uh, their storage systems because no one got fired for buying from EMC. But now, as things have progressed, we've gotten to the point where you know, storage is definitely following the same trends of virtualization that everything else is. The same trends towards agility, the same trends toward open source, the same trends towards automation. And it's just becoming one yet another application you install with all your other things that you install for a scale-out architecture. You may be surprised to know that um, uh, when Gluster started, we weren't a storage system per se. And uh, full disclosure, I was actually part of the Gluster acquisition by Red Hat. Uh, I was there a full five months before we were acquired. Uh, so I got tied in a little bit to the, the backstory while I was there. But we started off as cluster management. Um, we didn't do storage. Uh, our engineers had a different perspective of the data center. And you can sort of see the way it ties into the Gluster uh, project and community today. Um, for better or worse. It, they had a very unique perspective on storage. They didn't have the baggage of previous storage experiments um, or distributed file system experiments. So they really approached it from a new direction. And you can see that manifested in the architecture. I'll get into uh, the specifics of why in a minute. And what happened was they had this cluster management piece and they had this project down in South America with an energy company and the Synergy company said that your cluster management stuff is nice and all good and well, and thanks for putting together this cluster, but what we really need is help with our scale-out storage piece. We don't have anything that lets us do stuff with our tape backup system so that we can you know, grow it uh, to you know, multiple petabytes uh, and be able to scale out to the point where performance doesn't suffer uh, just because we reach a, a certain uh, amount of data to be stored. And so we, we thought about it, and you know, we were a cash trap startup, this being 2006. And we thought, well, we need the money, so we're going to say yes. But we thought that you know, within six months, we could use something off the shelf, and it would, be, you know, it would just fit into whatever else that we had put together, and it would just work, and we'd be done. Come to find out, all the storage solutions at the time were either too expensive, uh, did not scale out enough, uh, were proprietary and, and required signing uh, very uh, pernicious agreements with um, proprietary software vendors, um, or just didn't work as advertised. And so as most open source projects begin, uh, ours is similar. We, we said, well, we'll write ourselves. Uh, and as with many open source projects, uh, we didn't really understand what that meant at the time. We didn't understand just what we had uh, <laughs> set out to do. Uh, but you know, we made it. Um, we, we built a, 
essentially a Lego toolkit for building file systems on a scalable and scale out architecture. And that um, design decision has uh, yielded many benefits um, even until now because if you look at GlusterFS now, uh, because we're so flexible, because we're so um, hackable, the way I like to put it, I think we're the most hackable um, storage system uh, in the world. Uh, because of that, it's very easy to add features and remove features. It's very easy to bend GlusterFS to whatever you need to do. And in fact, you can make it look like a completely different beast than what you normally see when you unpack it. And so as we're working on this project, we came upon the idea, storage should be simple. Uh, why can't you just install software in your data center and bam, you have distributed storage? Why can't you aggregate and pool together uh, your data silos into one namespace? And as we thought about that problem, we thought, okay, well, this is the beginning of something new. So we're gonna take the work we did for this project, and we're gonna turn it into this open source project, and it's gonna be about scalability, it's gonna be about scale out, and it's gonna be about, we're gonna, you should be able to install it just like you would any other application. You should be able to do yum install or apt get install, and then you should have distributed storage clusters. And thus began GlusterFS. And so GlusterFS at its core is a unified distributed storage system. And um, the word unified there is very specific, and we choose that for a very special reason. And that's because we have, as part of a single namespace, we do not have data silos. So whether, you're, are, whether you are accessing a Gluster volume via the, uh, the Swift API, or the NFS mount, or the Gluster client, uh, or the libgf API client library, you're accessing the same data pool. Um, there are many storage systems that claim to be unified, but what they really offer is a set of data silos, and it's up to you to be able to manage those silos. We remove the silos entirely. Um, and yeah, there is some performance uh, give and take there, but for the most part, it works pretty well. Also very unique to uh, GlusterFS, it's completely in user space. Um, we don't have any uh, kernel modules specifically. Um, the Gluster client does use the Fuse kernel module. Uh, sometimes that uh, incites jeers from the audience, but uh, uh, recent versions of Fuse are actually quite good. Uh, we also feature a golden namespace uh, and stackable architecture. Uh, how many of you heard of uh, the GNU Herd project? Yay, okay. Um, one of the co-founders of Gluster was a contributor to the GNU Herd project, and so a lot of the architecture, a lot of the architectural ideas, and even some of the nomenclature was borrowed from that project. The idea of uh, implementing features within stackable user space translators was an idea borrowed from uh, the Herd project. The idea of everything being treated as a file was borrowed from the Herd project. Uh, and so you can see a lot of that manifested. You know, Herd lives on in, in GlusterFS, you could say. This just gives you kind of a bird's eye view of the GlusterFS architecture. Um, and then I have another slide following this that shows you specifically how the clients interact with the servers. But at its core, GlusterFS is uh, a data aggregator. It works in conjunction with disk file systems that support extended attributes. So XFS, um, ZFS works if you can uh, use it well on, on Linux, um, as well as ext4. Uh, the recommended file system is XFS. There are some people using it with ButterFS, uh, but anything that supports extended attributes. And there's a very specific reason for that. Uh, and that's because, um, well, I'll get into that in, in a minute. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a data aggregator. It, it sits on top of the disk file system. It allows you to distribute the, the data across multiple systems and create a single namespace and a single volume. Uh, you can replicate that volume to, to other servers as well. And then um, across the network, we have multiple access methods. We have the, the, uh, the client, uh, which again, uses the Fuse module in the, in the Linux kernel. Uh, we also we implement an NFS v3 server on the GlusterFS backend, so any NFS v3 client can connect. And then we have a new client library, and I'll get into more detail with this later. But this is how we do integrations. This is how we do the this is how we did the QMU integration, uh, so that now you can directly manipulate and manage Gluster volumes uh, from QMU. Um, this is how we did the Samba integration that uh, was recently pushed upstream into Samba 4.1. And in the future, we're probably going to use our Swift API. Uh, we'll probably move our Swift API to, the, to that architecture. Right now, the Swift API actually goes through the, uh, the Fuse module. Let's 
Similar slide, except show you a bit more detail about the client excess. Um, the Glusterfest client uh, understands the uh, understands where all the servers are. In other words, when you when a, when the GlusterFS client mounts a Gluster volume over a network, uh, it loads in all the translators that lets it distribute the data, either replicated or distributed. And from the GlusterFS client, if you're if it's accessing a distributed volume, um, it knows which server to actually go to, to to find the data. If it's if it's going through a replicated set, um, if it's reading, it will take the first responder and read from that set. If it's writing, it writes to both before it actually returns. And so we, we, we put a very uh, high premium on uh, consistency. And the same with LibGF API, the client library. Um, it, it, follows, it, it loads the same translators as the, um, as the GlowSurface client, so it, has, it follows the same protocol. The only one that's different here is the NFS v3 client, in which case it only attaches to one server on the back end uh, in order to, and the HA is actually done uh, on the back end. Uh, so it also means that if that connection between the client and server is, is severed, then you have to work out uh, the client side HA. These just give you an overview of all the different interface possibilities with AugustaFS volume. Um, on the back end, you can see the block device, and you can see files. Uh, these are virtual block devices, so ultimately they're virtual files. I mean, file. They're ultimately they're, they're files um, loopback mounted on the on the server. Um, we don't have any sort of like iSCSI integration yet. Uh, you can see on the transport layer, you can do IP or RDMA. There are many uh, there are many deployments in the wild that use um, InfiniBand. Uh, on the uh, on the file side, there are many uh, client uh, methods for for accessing data via either NFS v3 or or the Fuse module. Uh, or Samba, or the SMB, SMB v1, whatever Samba supports, uh, or HDFS. And on the block side, we have, um, with the recent release of GlusterFS 3.4, we have a, a QMU integration, which I referenced before. There's also a Cinder integration that went into Grizzly and a, um, a revamped version of that is going to Havana for OpenStack. On the um, object side, we have with the Swift API integration. We're actually collaborating with the Swift project upstream uh, so that the Swift API becomes more pluggable so that other storage systems can be used on the back end of Swift. Uh, and then we have LibGF API, which is our client library, which should be able to integrate with anything. Some features. So remember when I said that our engineers started off as cluster management people, they were not storage engineers. They had a different approach and different idea. And one of those was, they did not think that a metadata server uh, functions well in a scale-out environment. There were, seems to be limits to how much you can scale out if you're using a metadata server or services. Um, so we, we bypassed that entirely. And so we implemented what we're calling the Elastic Cache, which is a, a DHT uh, algorithm. And by doing that, we removed the round robin to, uh, to, to pull the, um, uh, the metadata server. Uh, we also make it, it's, it's a very fast calculation to determine um, where exactly the data is located. Uh, we basically create a, a hash value, and that hash value is consistent across the entire cluster. And it allows you to both read, find data to, for reading and writing purposes. Um, there is some magic that happens underneath if you move files from one place to another, but um, relatively speaking, it, it stays consistent across the entire cluster. Um, one of the uh, key design points that we made was multi-protocol access because we always thought that you should be able to access data your way uh, and, and not have it be dictated by your vendor. Uh, we have both synchronous and asynchronous replication. Uh, out of the box, it's synchronous replication, but we also have something called a geo-replication, which is master-slave and asynchronous, eventually consistent. Um, proactive self-healing, so if a, if a replicated volume goes down, uh, it can pull the uh, other replica for data that needs to be healed. Uh, and again, no silos. Um, we don't believe in data silos. We think what, you know, whether you're, you're, if you're, if you're accessing data via the object protocol, uh, some other type of application should be able to access the same data via another protocol. So you'll see, for example, and I'll, I'll have slides on this uh, later. So via the Swift API, you can do object storage. And our, our core belief is that 
just because you're doing object storage on one end doesn't mean you shouldn't be able to do manipulation of that data with something else over NFS. And generally, we try to just make hard stuff easier. Um, we have a, a Gluster D, which is a, a daemon for managing Gluster volumes. It allows you to uh, add servers on the fly, remove them, that sort of thing. Uh, as opposed to some um, storage systems, we don't require you to pre-allocate the amount of data you're going to be storing. You can add to that amount as you go along on the fly using Gluster D. Uh, I know that with some systems, you have to pretty much determine beforehand how much space you need. Uh, you don't need to do that with Gluster. And you can have a cluster up and running in about four commands. So how do we do all this great stuff? Uh, modularity. Uh, you can see, so when we implement the translator stacks in user space, you can see each of these um, boxes or rectangles here represents a translator. And so on the client side, you've got the, you've got the cluster client that goes through the fuse module, and you have the libjf API client. On, in both cases, uh, they they pull the um, the cluster server to get the um, to determine which translators are needed uh, for the data to go through for the data path, and so you can see here it's going through a distributed replicated stack, and then to the bottom of that stack it goes to the RPC client, which then um, works with the RPC server uh, on the cluster server side, and then down into the, uh, the local storage and the disk file system. What can you do with it? Um, you can store pretty much whatever you want. One of the main challenges we have in the data center is that year over year, the amount of storage space that's needed is almost doubling uh, every year. And so you need something that can expand with you, something that can grow with you, uh, and something that is, you know, we think that scale out is the way to do that. Uh, we, and we have a pretty good solution for that. So if you, for all sorts of unstructured data, uh, GlusterFS is ideal. I think I saw a slide one time where if you compare the amount of unstructured data growth compared to things like block storage growth, uh, it's, it's, it's a very wide, by a very wide margin, uh, unstructured data is by far growing more than anything else. The other design principle was that it should be for any environment. Whether you're deploying on AWS or an OpenStack cluster or, or on your KVM a hypervisor or on bare metal, it should look the same, it should act the same, it should be consistent across all platforms, and it should behave the same um, for whenever you're trying to interact using whatever toolkits you have. And so as you can see here, the, the, the kind of overriding theme is access, availability, consistency. These are all themes that um, have a great impact on the type of features we implemented because that was, that was our vision for what a storage system should be. This kind of shows you uh, an overview of what practice self-healing looks like. This is implemented in a pr the, the release prior to 3.4. It was in 3.3. Uh, this, this means that if a replicated set goes down, uh, we keep a change log of stuff that's changed since the uh, other replica went down. And so when it comes back online, it pulls the, the good replica and the, the heal commences. I, one of my, there's a mistake on this slide. Uh, I didn't correct it because I always like to ask the audience, where's the mistake? <laughs> so if you can see it, let me know. Anyone? Yeah, the, the, it, the distributed replicator are backwards. It should actually be going the other way. And so we um, also with the 3.3 release, we implemented something we called a unified file and object. And again, this gets back to the whole the core I concept of you know multi-protocol access um, and the ability to uh, attach to the same data regardless of the protocol or access method you're using. Um, in this case, I'm giving just sort of a, a dumb example of uh, uh, object storage over an HTTP request, and that same data can be accessed via NFS. Um, we map the um, Swift account container and object to, on the Gluster side, volume directory and file. That's actually going to change. Um, the account to volume uh, mapping works well if you're talking about a single tenant architecture. When you start going to multi-tenant, it requires us to change that mapping a bit. 
Uh, but conceptually, it's, it's still very much the same. And like I mentioned, we are, um, we are working with the upstream Swift project to, to make the Swift API more pluggable so that other uh, file systems can plug in the back end as well. Uh, conceptually similar, but for a different use case, we're talking about uh, Hadoop and HDFS. Uh, we created a, a plugin that you, that you can drop in on the Hadoop server so that you can write the results of your MapReduce jobs to GlusterFS. And it essentially just mimics the, uh, um, the HDFS API. And in order to do this, we had to essentially create the concept of data locality within GlusterFS, which didn't exist prior to this. But once we started working with Hadoop, we realized it was essential. And it kind of um, started us thinking towards the lines of, you know, GlusterFS can be the, the backbone of any kind of uh, data analytics uh, system, uh, especially if you're talking about a system where you're converging your compute and storage, and you need to move the, your applications closer to your storage, or in fact, run your applications on your storage server. Uh, that's one of the things that's enabled by the whole, you know, scale out, software only, you know, cloud storage. Now specifically what uh, we released with 3.4, it was released in July, uh, so a couple months ago. Um, the QMU integration, so you now don't have to do the, the fuse mount if you want to do um, uh, manage uh, virtual machines on, on a cluster volume. Um, we have something called Enhanced Quorum, uh, where you can have an entirely Quorum-based um, configuration management. And we, uh, we uh, rewrote parts of our uh, uh, Gluster DE daemon so that uh, it could be multi-threaded and actually um, scale up more. But first, on the um, on the QMU integration, so it, it, this is a, there's actually a very interesting story here. This is something we'd been thinking about for a while, and we hadn't quite gotten around to it because it wasn't the highest priority for us. But about a year ago, uh, we noticed that some engineers started showing up from uh, IBM's Linux Technology Center, and they said, "Hey, we'd like to do this," and we said. Sure, uh, because you're not going to say no, right? Um, and so they, they started writing in the, um, the QMU protocol piece, and we realized, well, we should probably have a client library in between, because when you start talking about um, latency, when, you, when you're managing VM images, uh, going through the fuse mount involves too much context switching, uh, and the latency becomes too high, especially when you're talking about many uh, VMs on a single volume. And so we, we revived an older project, um, that, work, that now we call libgif API. And that sort of sits in between. And on the back side, um, the Linux Technology Center engineers contributed a block device translator so that you can now sort of complete the circle. The, the QMU side, uh, the libgif API client library, and then the, um, and the block device translator in the back end. And uh, that, is the, that becomes sort of the basis for uh, what became later on the Nova integration, which I'll talk about later. Uh, so it has some very key uh, OpenStack uh, ramifications. This is a diagram actually submitted by the, the main uh, engineer who did the integration. Any questions so far? And then the, the middle piece of this is the libgf API client. So as we were working on this and we we realized that it could actually work and would be successful. Uh, we came to realize, well, maybe we should follow the same methodology for doing future integrations. And so it became the, the basis for doing the SAMBA integration, for example, the one that uh, has contributed upstream into SAMBA 4.1. Uh, it's going to be the basis for a future uh, implementation of the Swift API. Uh, it's going to be the, it was the basis for the Nova integration, which I referenced, which also means it's also the basis for the Cinder integration at least the one for Havana. And then finally, we had a revamped Quorum uh, for 3.4. Uh, so you can now do Quorum-based uh, configuration uh, across the entire cluster. Um, previous to 3.3, we didn't have a concept of Quorum. Uh, with 3.3, we had a very simple version of Quorum, which still required you having an odd number of nodes uh, in the cluster. And then with, um, with 3.4, we actually implement, implemented uh, a new translator that we're calling an Arbiter node. It implements uh, what, what could really be described as a, a fake uh, Gluster server. 
whose only purpose is to determine quorum. So that even if you have only a replica two uh, uh, volume setup, uh, you can still determine quorum and define uh, you know, whether or not you've reached quorum so you can make changes to the configuration. And then of course there's the concept of quorum to avoid split brains, and so you can have the, the healing going in the right direction when you have um, when you have a split brain, and how you recover from a split brain. How many of you face uh, split brains in your storage systems? Anyone? Okay, sometimes. There's in some cases the admins prefer that it be a manual process for recovery, uh, and in some cases they prefer it being automated like this. Uh, we actually make it a configurable option so that. And by default, it's turned off. So if you want core management, you can have it. If you don't, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. And then 3.4, this just goes through some of the changes that, uh, that we've made to core management. And finally, one of the, um, one of the, one of the main uh, new features that has come along recently uh, as a result of our collaboration with the Overt project it allows you to uh, manage, instantiate, uh, import existing Gluster uh, domains uh, using the Overt uh, interface. In fact, when you deploy Overt, you can do it either for a generalized uh, virtualization management or just for a Gluster-specific management. And also in-flight encryption. Not much, it, it's an open SSL integration. Um, not much really to be said about it. And these are things we're working on down the road. So it gives you kind of an overview of uh, what we've been working on on GlusterFS and how it can be kind of the, the core storage piece, distributed storage piece for, um, for, for a cloud uh, deployment. And specifically, when we're talking about OpenStack, so we've made a lot of progress in the space of one year. If you rewind it back to last year, we had we had zero integration, except for the Swift piece. We, we were just, we had a hacked up version of the Swift API that we're using for our Swift integration. Uh, it wasn't blessed by the upstream Swift guys. And so in the course of one year, we've, we've managed to uh, have that, have those, have our changes um, accepted upstream in Swift. We've, we then did a, a Cinder integration, and then afterwards we did a Nova integration to the point where Whereas a year ago we had nothing, now we have integration points with every layer of the OpenStack uh, piece. So whether you're talking about Cinder, Glance, or Swift, um, there's, a, uh, there's a Gluster integration there. If you go by the specific releases, uh, the, a lot of the integration work started with Grizzly uh, for OpenStack. And that was where we did, started doing the, the upstream collaboration with the Swift project. That's where we did the Cinder integration initially. Um, however, with the Grizzly release, the, um, the Cinder integration we did still required that you have a, a mounted file system through the Fuse module and deploying VMs on, on a Gluster volume that way, um, which is frankly not the best performing way to do it. Um, so with Havana, now we have the Nova integration working that goes through the libgf API client library, and it's able to use the QMU integration work that we put in for the last year. And so it's a much better, will be a much better performing um, uh, integration. With Glance, Glance is kind of um, an interesting story. I mean, I guess it, it, it works as a, um, if, you, if you define the, the access as, as file-based, uh, it'll it'll just go to the the Gluster volume uh, mounted over a file system, um, but you still get the same you know GlusterFS backend uh, uh, benefits. Um, and because Glance doesn't require you know high performance, we're kind of you know trying to figure out if we really want to spend more time uh, integrating with that piece of it. Uh, but when it comes to the Nova integration, you know we have um, a pretty good story now that will be released with Havana. Uh, if you're talking about live migration. Um, you're talking about using the, the, replica, the synchronous replication to, to make sure that your data consistency is maintained, uh, all these different things that um, you know, add up to some pretty good benefits. As I mentioned, we're, we are collaborating with uh, the Swift Upstream project to do our Swift API integration uh, and to make it more pluggable for other, uh, um, for other file systems on the back end.
I'm sorry? Oh, we, um, so whatever changes were needed to make the Swift API pluggable have already been accepted upstream in the, in the Swift project. Yeah, oh yeah, it's there. Um, the pieces that are Gluster specific are, are in our code base, and so we, we maintain those. Um, so. And then we can talk about sort of what's coming up in the future. You know, we've, had, we've got Swift, Glance, Nova, Cinder. What's coming up? Well, one of the things that people like to talk about is file as a service or, you know, file systems as a service. Uh, it, when you're talking about, you know, all this um, unstructured data that needs to be housed in these scaled architectures, how do you make it available in a multi-tenant environment in a way that uh, tenants don't, you know, clobber each other's data? Well, that's what Project Manila is designed to solve. Um, it's a joint project between NetApp and Red Hat and the Gluster community, and I think a few other vendors are joining in. And if you want to take a look at uh, their initial plans, you can go to the Launchpad page, which I have linked here. Uh, and I think the, the main, uh, we're planning to have it incubated for the Ice House release. It's so, if you're going to Hong Kong, uh, you should see a, a session about that uh, or catch up uh, with it later. But um, it's a very exciting, and it, for Gluster especially, it, it really highlights uh, some of our core strengths. Uh, because when you're talking about you know, treating everything as a file, and for Gluster, really everything comes down to file-based semantics, and specifically POSIX file-based semantics. It, it's really right up our alley. So we're very excited about this project. We're also very excited to be working with a lot of you know big names in the industry. Um, it seems to be something that uh, is important to a lot of different people, and so there's a lot of help uh, in uh, really uh, pushing this project. Uh, another integration project we're working with uh, multiple vendors on is the whole Savannah thing. Um, the ability to distribute your Hadoop workloads across an OpenStack uh, cloud is pretty interesting. Um, basically helping to scale out your, your Hadoop MapReduce jobs. It's, um, I don't know how far along this project is, but if there is a, I think there's a um, Savannah page on, uh, on OpenStack.org if you want to take a closer look. Does anyone actually use this? Is anyone familiar with it? Yeah? Okay. Does it work? Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. So why would you want to use GlusterFS with OpenStack? Uh, like I said, you know, no silos for data. A block file or object, it all comes back to the same place. And you can actually use it with your existing uh, toolkits to access the same data as you have accessible via, via OpenStack or really anything else. Um, the modular extensible architecture, the, the user space, uh, translator architecture is is um, really uh, designed to function well in a scale architecture in the cloud. Uh, it seems to be made for something like you know OpenStack deployments um, because of the we give you the freedom of whatever transport you want to use. Um, in addition to access, we also give you you know choice of transport and the other things I've mentioned that that make it you know pretty much a uh, a comprehensive solution. And now I can talk to you about kind of some of the things that are happening uh, as adjunct projects that you can find at forge.gluster.org. Uh, the Forge is something we released um, recently, I think about May uh, this past year. It's when we started noticing, um, and in fact, I'll come to the first example. We started noticing these projects out there on the internet that were related to Gluster or made use of Gluster features, but you know were not really available on Gluster.org or really anywhere for Gluster users. So we thought, well, we should bring it all together in one place, and thus the, the, the idea for the Forge was born. Um, and so now we have at the Forge uh, some really interesting sort of adjunct projects that can help you complete your deployment. So one of these was PMUX. And PMUX, if you think that Hadoop is overweight and more than what you need, um, I would recommend you take a look at this. PMUX is something that actually makes use of uh, GlusterFS extended attributes to do its MapReduce jobs. And so if you're, if you're looking for a, uh, a log management solution or some other way to grep through um, uh, much data that you have distributed over many volumes, uh, then this is a, one way to do that. You create these mapper jobs and they, and they run and then you, they return values. 
Uh, as part of this project, there's also um, a RESTful gateway, uh, as well as a, uh, there's actually, they actually create a log viewer that goes through the API gateway. It's a really interesting project. Probably, I was really happy to find this. I, um, I, one day I saw a Twitter tweet coming from the, um, the Ruby Gem account, and it mentioned this. And I thought, oh, well, I should take a look. Uh, also on the forwards, there's the, the, um, the project home for the Gluster implementation of the Swift API. So if you want to take a look at that, you could do it there. Also, I think with every release of GlusterFS, there is a, an accompanying um, Gluster Swift piece. So if you want to check it out, it's pretty easy to do so. Uh, also, the HDFS plugin. Uh, you can find all the information about that on the Forge at slash Hadoop. Uh, notice where I say per HCFS guidelines. Uh, Hadoop compatible file system is actually a project uh, incubating with, within the Hadoop community uh, in the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, it's to make uh, Hadoop, uh, make HDFS more pluggable for different um, uh, storage backends like ClusterFS. And that's basically all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you.